everybody's telling me these stories. I'm like, you know, how awesome would it be to document these stories and share it with the world, right? Because if I'm inspired by it, I'm sure there's somebody that's just like them. There's another alcoholic out there. There's another person dealing with PTSD. There's another person dealing with weight loss. Few of my friends ended up robbing a gas station. At the time, I had a gun. They were like, let me borrow your gun. And I was like, no. Well, they said, we're gonna do it anyways. Long story short, I let them borrow my gun. And then I get a phone call. Uh, and they said, we're being charged with an armed robbery and an aggravated assault. It teaches you who you really are. And either A, you're gonna accept it and you wanna be a better person and stick around the mats, or you're gonna say, no, this isn't for me, whether it's your ego, whether it's your personality, or whether you don't have the discipline, and you're gonna get the heck out of the gym. This small blind guy, he's probably 150 pounds of that, did it blind, and he's still doing it at this level. Come on, what, what are your excuses? Kenny Kim, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we're good, mate. Thank you very much. How's your uh, How's your week been? You know, same as usual. You know, busy week of training, training people, staying active. Uh, you know, running after my son. So yeah, very good. Yeah, nice. So you're at home at the moment. You're not traveling or anything? No, you know, I traveled all year. So I think. Uh, well, I've got one more coming up here in a few weeks. I'll be going to. Uh, Dallas for the uh, Nogi Pans, but yeah, I've traveled every single month. I've been either out of the state or out of the country. So I try to keep my holidays around October and November all the way through December to be home uh, with my family, with my students, so I can spend some quality time, yeah. Yeah, nice. And are you competing at the Pans or are you just going there to coach? Or- I'm going to coach. You know, I had uh, a big ACL surgery back two and a half years ago. And ever since then, that was the last time I actually had to uh, push my uh, surgery date a little bit because as I had my surgery date, another super fight came up. So I decided to jump in on that. So I called my doctor. I said, you know what? Let's push it a few months. You know, if I, I can't hurt it any worse than what I have. So I jumped in on the uh, super <laughs> and then ended up getting the surgery. But ever since the surgery, you know, I just hadn't had the, the urge. And uh, it's more of a, like, I don't want to be selfish anymore, you know, like, when you compete, you have to be selfish. Like I, I travel with my guys and I have to train them and I, I, I want to be there for every one of them, whether they're white belts or black belts. I want to be able to coach and I want to be, be able to be there by side. And when I'm competing, I have to be selfish, meaning I have to take time away from them. I have to do my own training and I have to, you know, really take care of me. Right. And so I'm at a point where, you know, I've been in the game a long time and, you know, and competing is, is something that's fun. Right. And I still want to have the fun, but I also want to relay that, uh, the, 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 the fun message to my students. I want to be there for them. So last couple of years, I hadn't competed. And uh, I don't know if I will. I don't know if I won't. I'm not going to say yes or no. So, But that's kind of where I am with competing. Yeah. And did you say you've got some students competing at the pants? Yeah, I got, I got a handful. Um, you know, we always have – we don't have a lot. But we always have a handful of people going to the major tournaments. And uh, if I can, I always try to be there for them, especially the, uh, the major ones. And uh, there's, I mean, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't, but I, I do my best. Yeah. And, and, and where you said that's in Dallas? Yeah, Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas area. Yes, it's, it's a surrounding area, so they're pretty close. Yeah, we're still, we're still learning more and more about the, the U.S. geography. So you have to tell us where that is in relation to where you're based. <laughs> so from here, well, from England, from you guys, it'll be going to another country. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, Texas actually itself is big, probably just big as half of Europe, you know. Two and a half size of the U.K.? Yeah, I mean, it usually takes, I drove past, I mean, I drove through it when I was driving, when I was younger, going to California. And it, it takes about 24 hours to go from state to state. I'm talking about nonstop, like nonstop, you know. And so it's about a three-hour flight from where I am. I'm in Atlanta. I'm in the southeast part of the, of the country. And Texas is directly in the middle of the country. And then all the way to the west is California. So right in the middle, in the bottom south, is Texas where Dallas is. So it takes about three hours flight time. Driving-wise, it would probably take me 15, 20 hours, right? So. Wow. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a bit yeah, of a trip. A yeah, I think we could get what to probably Poland in that time. 
A three a three hour flight, yeah, to Poland. <laughs> yeah, genuinely, yeah, I think it's Poland. Yeah, yeah. pretty much the middle of Europe for us. Yeah, I was in England uh, in 2019, and uh, and it was great because we were able to just catch the train. I was in the Netherlands, and I was in here. I mean, I was going everywhere, <laughs> right? And I'm like, man, back home, I would be, I would just be in another city in my state. I wouldn't even be in another state. I would be in my state. You know, that's actually wild to think of, isn't it? Yeah, like the vastness of the, U- the of America compared to the UK. We're so lazy. Like if we have to travel three hours i'm like that's too far <laughs> <laughs> if i have to travel three hours to london i'm like that's too far no, somebody said uh there was a i was watching this tiktok video and they said i think it was a uh, some european um uh dude was saying hey americans are so uncultured and they never travel and another uh, english guy came on and said well let me put this into perspective you can get on a train you know around an hour you'd be in another country and another two hours you'd be in another country and they were like, exactly what I was saying. It's like, yeah, you can drive for six hours. You're still in the same state. Better yet, you know what I mean? <laughs> you can drive 10 hours. You're still in the same. Like, it's like Americans aren't. They're like, mm. the guy was like, Americans are not not cultured. They just, they can travel. All, I, I still haven't been to all 50 states. I mean, and I travel a lot. And most people get out, don't even get out of their uh, state or, or just their region. Like, for example, I'm in the Southeast. It's there's probably six, seven states within us, right? And just to travel that, I mean, it may take many, many years just to get there because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, driving, a lot of, I mean, cost a lot of money. It's not like you can buy a 50, 50 euro um, train ticket. I mean, if you want to fly, I mean, you're paying two, three, four hundred dollars minimum. And then you got to get a rental car because, you know, the public transit isn't, isn't like it is in Europe. So when you fly to another city, you got to get rental car, you got to get hotel. So anywhere you fly, like all these tournaments, even some of the local ones that we go to, it cost me personally just to be there for my students, minimum of a thousand bucks, thousand dollars, because after all is said and done, not only am I missing out on what I have here, I'm not able to work and teach my students here, but like, being at a venue, like I gotta pay for parking, I gotta pay for car, I gotta pay for gas, food, hotel, and flight. Yeah, it's the cheapest, thousand bucks. Wow. And I guess in America as well, you have such different climates all around America. So you don't really need to leave the US, do you? You know, where is in the UK, it's miserable here. It rains pretty <laughs> much all year. So we have to go to different countries for some sun. You know, we have to, because else we we would all just end up ending it really <laughs> just just reach depression i was there in march of 2019 and i was it's looking at the month. weather and i thought okay it's not gonna be that bad so i i took a light jacket and like a raincoat that was about it and i mean every picture my buddies and i we were you can see us just like curled up like this <laughs> so cold the wind and then the rain and it was it was yeah it, it just wasn't yeah it's just this it's just miserable mate did you see the sun while you were here uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sounds about right. Um, Kenny, speaking of travel, I, I, I really want to chat to you about obviously Matt made. Yeah. I've been enjoying the show and obviously that involves a bit of travel and going around and meeting some amazing people and, and hearing some stories about how jujitsu has obviously changed and impacted people's lives massively. So I, I appreciate some of our audience may not be familiar with that docuseries that you've done. So would you be able to just tell us um, sort of what Matt made what is and, and, and then sort of talk us through maybe some of your experiences with that show? Sure. So Matt made basically was uh, born out of, um, I, I guess you can say almost as a, 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 my, my, my story because what jiu-jitsu has done and martial arts in general, but what jiu-jitsu has done for me is something that I, I, I I mean, like, I, I, I owe my life to it. I would, without it, I would, I really wouldn't know where I would be right now. You know what I mean? Um, and so, as we know, like, jujitsu, I always use it as a uh, direct parallel to life, right? And some people see it differently, especially nowadays. And younger kids may just see it as just a sport. You know, I'm just going to go out and become this champion. Uh, and a lot of the, the, true aspects of what jiu-jitsu represents has been lost. That's, I mean, in my personal opinion, my humble opinion, and people can have their own opinions and what they think about, but jiu-jitsu to me is a way of life, just like any martial arts, right? Um, and I don't, it, it really teaches you about yourself. It teaches you who you really are. And either A, you're going to accept it and you want to be a better person and stick around the mats, or you're going to say, no, this isn't for me, whether it's your ego, whether it's, 
your personality or whether you don't have the discipline and you're going to get the heck out of the gym, right? And so for me, when I found it, for me, I was very young. I say very young. At the time, I was maybe 20 years old when I started jiu-jitsu. Before that, I had some previous other martial arts experience at 20 years old. So at the time, I was pretty young because this is back in like 1999, year 2000. So the, the sport hasn't been, you know, big at all. I mean, it was still in its infancy. And we literally had two gyms here where I am, you know, maybe two black belts at the time. And so uh, I got in it because I was like, wow, this this is amazing. I thought I was the hot shit. And then, you know, I always tell this story. I had <laughs> this 45 year old named Darcy that was arm barring me over and over. And I said, oh, my God, I, <laughs> I got to start doing this stuff because I'm not going to let this old lady, you know, tap me over and over. So that was a pivotal point. Right. Either you a take it and be like, you know what? She got lucky or I wasn't ready. I could have said, made all these excuses and not gone back. Right. But I was like, OK, well, I accept it. I need to learn this stuff. So immediately I started training. Right. And so fast forward to now, um, the 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 parallel, again, of what jujitsu brings to life. I've all my lessons that I've learned, business lessons to um, uh, relationship lessons to financial lessons. Everything has come come from the mats. OK. And the stories that I heard when I was, you know, traveling, people would come up to me every time I teach a seminar, every time we go to a competition, you know, usually, you know, it would start with us, you know, training or, you know, teaching and whatnot. And afterwards, we'll go out to eat and we'll sit there and talk. And, you know, everybody's talking and most people will op start opening up and they're like, you know, if I didn't get into this, I would be dead right now. And I'm like, oh, tell me your story. And they're like, hey, you know, I was an alcoholic, da 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 And they're going on with their story. Mm -hmm. Another person, another city, everybody's telling me these stories. I'm like, you know, how awesome would it be to document these stories and share it with the world, right? Because if I'm inspired by it, I'm sure there's somebody that's just like them. There's another alcoholic out there. There's another person dealing with PTSD. There's another person dealing with weight loss. Like, what if I can share this? And so I came up with this big idea of like, okay, I need to share these stories, but how? Like I didn't have the resources. So I started doing a little research. This is right before the pandemic. And I'm like, okay, I want to make a reality TV docu-series. Like I want to be able to share this because what's the biggest platform, right? I mean, obviously the internet, right? So I thought, okay, well, we need to start on YouTube because if we can get some audience and I've already had a little bit of traction of you know followers following me, I said, if I can get this traction, we're going to be able to share these stories. And it wasn't about monetizing uh, the videos. It wasn't anything. It was li literally like I wanted to do it out of my heart. Like, I, And that's still the, the case. I want to be able to share these stories. And when people message me and call me and tell me, you saved my life, I said, you know, because after watching your story, you know, there's a one specific story, this um, uh, uh, veteran, military veteran, uh, I get a message. He said, it, it wasn't even a long text. It was like, watch your mat mate story. Put the gun down. First jujitsu session tomorrow, I will be mat mate. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it right now. Mm, that's amazing, mate, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he literally had the gun to his head and he was watch, scrolling through his phone, watched it. He said, I'm going to do it. And, you know, it's those kind of stories that inspire me to do this more and more and more and more, right? Mm. So fast forward anyways, so where we are, I said, okay, well, we got to do this. So we started putting the team together. And in the beginning, it was just a, okay, you know, some of my students, hey, you know, can you work with cameras? Like, yeah, I've shot some stuff before. Okay, no. I have a friend, he can probably do some editing. Okay, cool, cool. So we got some guys together. It was like three people and like, okay, well, let's uh, uh, find a location. So I found a guy in Florida. Uh, he was a personal contact. I knew where he was, he owned a gym. And he said, oh yeah, I called him up. And he was like, yeah, there's a like a good taco spot we can go to and chill out. And there's this person that's, will be a perfect story. And so on the day we're supposed to go down is the day we get shut down for mm. like, like everything. Oh, just, God. I don't think we can do this. And uh, I mean, it was devastating, but I mean, what do you do? Like it was, we didn't know what was going on. And once everything shut down, you know, we were done. Not, not just that, but everything was done. My school was shut down. So that this was like on the, uh, uh, the back end because I wasn't even thinking about this because we're like, okay, how are we gonna pay bills now? You know, because my business closed, uh, everything, nobody knew what was going on at the time, right? 
And so, which was a, a blessing in disguise, because if, if I would have done it like that, we would have probably done one episode, maybe two, and be like, okay, that was cool to try. Nothing, you know, because it really wasn't a professional. It, it would have been shot like, you know, with your, you know it, it would have looked okay, but it wasn't to the magnitude of what we had. And so it was kind of on the back burner. And, um, you know, anybody that I met, and they were always, they would always ask me, what keeps you going? And, you know, the, the story of Matt May would always come. Anyways, I, I, I uh, one of my students, his the, the dad, he eventually became my map mate partner. One day we were talking. He was like, "Man, I love it." You know, he was like, "You know, I'd be willing to do one episode with you." I said, All right, "Yeah, let's do it." Like, I, I'm down. And so we decided to do it, and we start looking, and it was crazy because I thought, "Okay, well, we don't need that big of a production." You know, in my in my mind, I'm like, "Oh, maybe a, you know, a couple thousand bucks, and that's still a lot of money. We can get this thing done." And then we get, we find a, a few different uh, uh, companies to work with, right? Different production companies. And then the first quote we got was, yeah, we can get everything done. The first episode, like one pilot episode. And they were like talking about $150,000. <laughs> one pilot episode. We we're like, okay, well, thank you. We'll get back. <laughs> <laughs> what a nice offer. <laughs> Anyhow, so we, we gather some good people and put a team together, like guys who've been in the uh, industry. And it still wasn't cheap, and, and people still are baffled when I tell them this. So my first episode actually costed us like around $55,000, $60,000. That's some investment there, bud. Whoa. Yeah, and this was the uh, Nashville, first episode that we did in Nashville. And I had my good friend, Dean Thomas, ex-UFC fighter. He's, he's still announcing, you know. Uh, anyways, 55, 60,000. And this is basically coming out of our pocket. So my partner and I, we said, okay, let's do it. Just one episode. Now, were we looking for something with one episode? No, I mean, it was just like, okay, it was my passion. Like, I, I want to do this. So we put the money in, we do the episode. I mean, and then we probably had, it was like six, seven crew members. It was, it was surreal. Like we got it done. It came out and it was so awesome. And then the flood of messages, people were like, oh, my God, that was amazing. Da, 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 da. And so my partner, I sat down, we said, oh, my God, the, the feedback is just amazing. What can we do with it? And so we decided, let's do one more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one more. And this time we did it a little bit uh, cheaper because we knew exactly what was going on. Like, OK, we don't need this. We need this. We knew how to, you know. Anyways, and we did it all within driving distance to where we are. So we didn't have to fly a crew or ourselves anywhere, you know. And so anyways, this time it was probably like, you know, 45 to 50. So in the in the pocket, we were already 100 grand in. And this is Man, why. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. And I, this is probably the first time I actually like really talked about like how much we put in. And, this is like, and we're just talking about money, but I didn't get paid for that. You know what I mean? My partner didn't get yeah. for that. Like this was just we put our money in. We just said we. we I just truly believed in what this uh, 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 Matt May could do to people. Like, and, and then mm -hmm. if that's the only thing that it did, great. Like, I, I'm I'm satisfied with that. So we do the second episode again. It turns out great, and we're just like we're on this fence. Like, man, this is just like we got something here that's so good, uh, inspiring so many people. Like, we need to do this. So we decided, okay, and each time it was like one more or whatever. So we just said, okay, we got with the crew. We said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do seven episodes. We're going to do five more. So we said, let's cut the prices where you guys have a guaranteed uh, work for the next five, whatever, uh, not seasons, uh, episodes. And uh, we need a break. And we also gave them a stake. We said, okay. Once we are able to maybe sell this docu-series or sign a new contract with them, we'll give you this much, like whatever their stake was. Instead of getting, okay, you know, let's say your price is uh, $20,000, but you said, you know what? I want to put in 50% of that into uh, um, the company. And so we gave them a partial, like, okay, this is how much you're going to be able to have. So right off the bat, they're, even now they don't have any, they didn't get paid. They got paid for whatever they opted in for. But the rest, basically, it sits on like if once this thing goes and we're able to sign with something, we're going to be able to take that and then 
pay them on tenfold because they opted in, right? So we got that done. Anyways, long story short, we got seven episodes done. It's on YouTube. And but that's the docu series. That's that's very inspiring. It's fun. It's family oriented. It tells a great story. It's you know the food, the culture, all of that. But the the main thing we got while we were filming is the short stories. I don't know if you guys seen like the Instagram like yeah. or it's like one minute stories of people telling them how jujitsu has changed life. So um, I think it was uh, actually the first episode we got a couple. So we're filming the actual episodes. And while we're filming, we, we got a bunch of people that's on set and they're talking about, oh man, jujitsu has been great. We just said, hey man, just keep the camera rolling. And our crew member just kept the camera rolling and got a bunch of good footages. And then we edited it out and it was like, and then we put it on Instagram and it was a hit. People were like, oh my God. And most people don't even know that we have a docu-series. They just know the Instagram, like Matt made stories. Yeah, well, that's how I found you initially. That's yeah. exactly how I found you, just scrolling for Instagram really cool story and i was like oh that's that's good and then i just looked at your instagram i didn't realize until i looked further into you that it was a full docu-series yeah, exactly that's how it is so and then so we basically every uh location we went to we actually had a section where we blocked off and we put a camera there and we just said you know while we're uh filming you know i'm teaching a seminar and stuff so we have a bunch of people that will show up and be like guys anybody that has a story that you want to tell a story to go over to the camera and we would have a line and people will be telling their stories. And at first, people would be, you know, they wouldn't open up. But once they started talking, and they would open up. And we heard some, like, I'm sure you guys heard uh, a woman talking about her son being killed. We were all there, like, like a robber came in, killed her son. And then, like, it, I mean, it's some bizarre stories and how you get yeah. to them, right? And so then we knew, we're like, okay, we got something big here. Not only the Doctor series, but, like, these little short, what we'll call short stories. These short stories are... What's inspiring? So we basically took those shorts. So we still have them. Like I'll, I'll go to Worlds and uh, Pans and whatnot, and I'll basically walk around and people notice me, and I'm like, "Hey, you want to tell your story?" So we'll get a handful of stories here and there. So we try to release one every few weeks. And so what we have now is these short stories. So on the back end, MattMade.com is now we have the largest jujitsu directory in the U.S. So we have seven thousand jujitsu schools in our directory. It's about to be launched soon, which would be perfect timing. And so what people are going to be able to do is once they watch the story, they're going to say, oh, my God, maybe I want to do jujitsu. And they click, you know, wherever in our link. It goes to mattmade.com, which also forced to findmymat.com. And they're going to be able to go in by, by city name, by zip code, by school name, by instructor name. It doesn't matter. You type it in, it's going to pop up. So each state, let's say, for example, say to Georgia, It'll have you have 271 entries, and then from there you can go to your own city, and then you'll have all the schools there, right? And so now what we're doing is we're connecting people, new people, to jujitsu by allowing them to do one click and then finding a school, and then within that they're going to be able to see the ratings. Like we're going to be able to give them check marks. We're going to be able to say, hey, these people have, you know, men classes, women classes, kids classes, you know, open mats. So they're going to be able to choose that. Right. And then which is closest to their distance. So we're giving them a, a tool to find a jujitsu school. So now we're also giving uh, gyms an opportunity to find new audiences through these stories. So now you have people from your own place. Like, let's say, for example, my students will tell their story and people see that and then they click and you have some people in the surrounding areas. They're going to be able to go to the website and then boom, you'll pop up however many schools you want. Oh, I want to find open mat on this day. Boom, you find it in their city. Here it is. We're going to be able to link people together. So it's now we're, you know, making it not only just inspiring stories for people to see, but we want people to take action. We want people to be able to, you know, find a place near them and start training because it doesn't matter. I don't, you know, people can train wherever they want. I, I feel like, you know, there's a, a culture that meets that certain, certain person, but we want to give them the option to be able to find those schools, the gyms, and then give it give it a try, right? Again, that's inspiring. That's just sharing jujitsu, and that's basically where my head is right now. So it's it's a whole nother, uh, 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 you know, think of ideas and and, and uh, projects that we're working on. Yeah, that sounds amazing, man. It's such a great idea. It really is because I think, like you say, telling the story is one thing, but kind of removing that barrier to entry is 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 going to be so powerful for people. How do how do gyms get added to that? directory and you mentioned there was a rating as well how does that work so right now what we've done is we basically scraped 
Uh, again, this is just within the United States for the time being. We basically scrape every directory out there from, you know, okay, you can go to your Gracie local, uh, Gracie Baja uh, uh, directories. We scrape that. We scrape Google. We scrape every major um, directory and we put it into one, right? And so everybody will be added on there already, right? And so once we launch it, we're going to give the school owners an option to be able to say, okay, Am I on there? If they're not, they can. We're gonna have a section where they can message us, and we'll get them added on there. And when they get added, basically they'll be under the, the, the state, the city, the zip code, or whatnot, and the instructor's name. We're only gonna be able to have basic information in there: the gym name, phone number, website, and address, right? And then we're gonna be able to have a premium section. Obviously, we have to be able to pay for this stuff, right? And so this, it's not much, it's minimal, but when they do that, they're going to be able to add, we're going to have sections where they can add introduction videos, little short stories of like people telling about why, and then we're going to be able to have hyperlinks of all their information, directions, you know, their rating, we'll uh, transfer that over from Google, how many stars they have, um, everything that you need. And then they're, they're going to be basically have, have a check mark next to it their name and they'll be able to be at the top of their city name. So we're giving them like, hey, you want to be the city champion school? Boom, you're going to be here, right? So we'll give them options. Like, again, you know, it, it, I, I wish that we could all do this free, but this website's costing us, again, I mean, I'm not even going to say the price, but- How many want to know? End of it, you know, we're literally, I mean, with this project, Matt made project, we're, you know, $250,000, $300,000 $300, deep in. And when do we get to see that? I don't know. We may not ever get to see that. But that's okay because when I, I truly believe in, in, in what we're doing. And so uh, we're going to keep pushing on. So that's that's how they can, uh, once it launches, that, that's what they have to do. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think obviously there's there's not just the, the price, but obviously people's or, or gym owners willing this to kind of get behind, the, I guess, the cause, if you want to call it that, right. and support right. that as well. So that, that's great, I think, mate. And I, I wanted to ask because we, we've, you know, we, we kind of know, and I think – you know, if we're in jiu-jitsu, we kind of know this answer. But why do you think jiu-jitsu is, has such a profound impact on people versus just normal sports? Why is it different? Um, I think I've talked about this before. And it's even different than other martial arts. If you look, I mean, I've trained martial arts all my life ever since I was a kid. Martial arts itself gives uh, almost the same vibe as jiu-jitsu. So why don't karate, Japanese jiu-jitsu, boxing, even wrestling, judo, they, they may say different, but the community is, isn't like this, right? Like, if you really look, the community isn't like this. It's really different. And I think there's several different reasons. And again, this is just coming personally from me. Okay? And some people may agree, some people may disagree. Uh, so most of the martial arts come from the East, right? And so there's a lot of tradition behind it. And even it still gets kind of mocked these days especially in america like for example gracie baja you know uh they put up some videos of like oh you have to bow on and off the mat you have to bow to carlos and elio you have to you can't you can't tie your belt in front of and and people go crazy over that like, oh that is so cultish you don't do that th this and that i mean listen if you don't like it you don't have to do it but going back the eastern philosophy they're very much into that militant style of respect right this is the rules of the house so you have to follow it and people have no problem following that like you don't it doesn't make you a lesser person if you do that but here in the west that gets kind of like you know yeah. people in their eyes like i'm not doing that i'm not bound down to no man i'm not calling him by a professor or a master i'm a grown-ass man okay well if that's the way you think you know great but this is how it became what it is, right? So anyways, that, in the, in the West, people just couldn't get behind that, right? So martial arts was big, people were training, but the closestness of people, the community, just wasn't getting built. So when this thing went over to Brazil, now this is, this is my, my true belief, went over to Brazil. Brazilian South Americans are very, you know, intimate and touchy people, right? And so with 
in traditional martial arts, you would never see people hugging. You would never see your instructor, your coach, hugging a student, hugging anybody. It would just be like a handshake and a bow maybe, right? Because they wanted to keep that distance. Brazilians, on the other hand, I mean, literally, you know, hugging, kissing, I mean, very intimate people. And so I think when the, uh, the, the art got developed in Brazil, that some of the, uh, the traditions got left behind and what was left was just, okay, jujitsu, right? And there were people who were just training jujitsu for jujitsu. And what people realized was not only was training there, there was brotherhood there because not everybody liked, like, especially in Brazil, I don't know if you guys ever been, you know, obviously it's a third world country. Most, some, some of the younger guys, they don't work. And so literally they hang out in the gym for five, six, seven, eight hours a day. They're just there all day, right? And so the bond is built there, right? And so I think when it hit the States, not only was it an effective martial arts, people like this, I got to learn this thing. People realized they belong, like they, they were part of a club, right? Because once, like, I know it's like that in England too. So... People in the neighborhoods, which we don't have here, in their little boroughs or whatnot, neighborhoods, they literally grew up together. They have their lo local you know, pubs they get, go, get together with. They have their local friends that they come up with. Here is so different. We don't have that. We don't have a community where we belong to. So once you're out of school, let's say high school, even college, you get married or you have a job, and that's pretty much it. And you have a family. Basically, you, 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 you have your family, then you have your job. Have family, you have a job. Like, nobody really has a personal life. And again, I'm not saying that everybody, but from what I see, it's like an average man, once they're out of school and married, it's job, home, kids. When do you have time for yourself, right? And again, this goes back to like, even men having a uh, 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 mental awareness because men break down. We try to hold it in and hold it in and hold it in. And one day when, when that man blows up, it's, it's dangerous. And so I think the mats and then the, the intimacy of other men, being around other men gives us this tool to deal with life a little bit better. You get what I mean? Our stress yeah. is relieved a little bit more. My brother that's there shaking my hand, telling me good job, telling me, hey, we should go watch the fights this weekend. Let's go compete together. Let's that building of community, I think, is what jujitsu is. And again, and I, I, I brought it the, the, the Eastern philosophy because I think if that was still in place, it wouldn't be where it is because mm. the closeness, you couldn't get close to your, 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 your uh, uh, training partners or your coach or whoever it is, right? But the Brazilian style, the South American style is where people are hugging, people are just hanging out on the mats. It was very fluid rather than being so rigid that you followed this one protocol of like, you bow, you do this, you, you call me sir, you know, that was out of the door, right? Which again, I think some of that is coming back in a good way. Like I, like I said, I mean, I, I, I think Gracie Baja is great. I think the their philosophies, their teachings, and people may say they're McDojo, they say it because it's a big organization, but like they're the biggest organization in the world. They have one of the best, like not one, many of the, greatest fighters have come out of that organization. So how can you mock somebody like that? But, you know, people will always mock the bigger uh, uh, organization, bigger groups, because they're not there yet, right? But I think some of it's coming back, like, okay, you know, bowing, you know, um, having the respect part. And I think that it's very important. I mean, respect is um, mutual respect, I should say, is very important within a, a group. I mean, look at even in the American wrestling room. Who calls their coach by their first name? Nobody. Only here in jiu-jitsu, now they're like, no, I don't call my, I don't call him professor. No, he's not a professor. He's not a master. He's, he's, he's just a coach, but I'm going to call him by his first name because I'm a grown man. But it's like, why only this? Sometimes it, it, it baffles me because I don't care if it's baseball, football, soccer, you look at any sports, your coach is your coach. Your instructor is your instructor. Even cheerleading, you don't ever call them by their first name. Now, off the mat, you can do whatever you want, right? I, I, I personally don't care. And people ask me when, when they first start, what should I call you? I said, you can call me whatever you want. Whatever, whatever, you know, I, I'm not a big, you know, 
but it still does baffle me like why some people are very insistent on like no i'm not dipping down to that level no he's a man just like me he put on you know he puts pants on one leg at a time just like me i'm like okay well i always show respect to my teachers coming up i'll call them mr and mrs you know whatever their name was my coaches my instructors you know like even my professor whenever i'm on the mat with him i don't ever call him by his first name Mm -hmm. right and so but that's the way it is. That's where the state of jujitsu is, I think, right now. And, uh, and, and I think the, the, the fast growth of jujitsu has kind of, kind of gotten us where, like, there's two splits. Now we have um, the traditionalists and then some of, some of the new wave people that are doing their own thing, you know. And, but I can't say. I mean, it's still growth, so I, I think it's great. Yeah. No, it's a really interesting take, mate. And I've... You know, we've often talked about, I think, the brotherhood on the mats and the shared learning, the shared sort of physical adversity, the trust that you get with people. But I've never really thought about that cultural bit. Yeah. When I have been to Brazil, I went with a Brazilian friend um, and the people there were lovely. All of his family treated me like their own. Oh. And there was a, there was a, I went to Manaus and um, my friend met his um, sort of one half of his maternal family. And honestly, every member of his family came out to meet us. There was probably about 20 <laughs> people at this house party. The funny thing is only two of them spoke English. <laughs> and at one point, uh, my friend came up and he said, oh, do you, they've asked if you want to do a speech. Uh-huh. And I was like, a speech? And they were like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, is it, is it customary to do a speech? And they were like, no, they're just, they're just being polite. And I was like, can they understand anything I say? And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm good. But it was just the fact that they were so welcoming. They were offering yeah. that platform mm-hmm. to me. And they are really lovely people. And you know, in the in the UK in the early days of, of jiu-jitsu, so I, I started in probably about 2006 and meeting some of the Brazilians over here, so like sort of Bralio Estima, for example, and his brother Victor are two good examples. Such nice people, really playful um, and really good energy. And yeah, I think you're right. I think that there's definitely a cultural piece there that I've never really thought about. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest pieces because again, like what I've noticed within the Brazilians are whether you're at their house, if you're at a party, so when people come, it doesn't matter if you know them or not. So if I walk in and I see five guys, they come up to every single person, shake their hands, say hello, 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 hello. When they're leaving, they come bye, 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 or hug, 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 right? And so I kind of adapted that culture because of my teammates and a lot of my friends are Brazilians. So especially here in America, we're very uh, based on individualism. It's us. It's my time. It's me. So... A lot of guys will show up to the gym, and I still see this uh, in other gyms. People will show up. Really, it's they're almost like a ghost. They don't say hello. They come in, they get dressed, and they sit on the mat until class starts, and they, they do their thing. When class is over, they leave. Where, like, I created a culture now where when people come in, they say hello, they bow on the mat, and they come to every single person, bump, shake, whatever it is, tap on the shoulder, hello, what's up, what's up, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, after class, same thing. If they're leaving early, boom, boom, boom. So the connect, you're building that connection. You're building a community because, you know, when, when it's on based on individualism, because you're not going to get better by yourself. I'm not getting better without my training partner over here. So why wouldn't I say hello and goodbye and, you know, uh, show some kind of affection, you know? And so... I, I think it's really up to the instructor to create that positive environment. And then that's where people want to be. That's where majority of people want to be, right? Like not only the 27 year old competitors, but the kids, the moms, the dads, the, the, the regular people who really benefit from training jujitsu. And that's what truly what I believe. Yeah, no, this is so true. And you mentioned about the, the sort of British culture a, a little while back as well. And, I don't know if Danny agrees, but it feels like sadly we're we're losing some of that that community culture in the UK, certainly since the pandemic. Um, and I think one thing about British culture as well, which I think a lot of people will probably agree, is it, it can be quite negative. Um, we're not always the best supporters of each other. And for me, over the years, I've found a lot of solace in jiu-jitsu because it is a very positive environment where people are trying to help people and make each other better. And I think for me, certainly in the UK, that's a big benefit of it. Yeah, again, it's just, if you look at the big picture, jiu-jitsu just, uh, it creates that positive, you know, uh, environment in a community. And so wherever it is, and it's like, it's just a universal language. Like I travel the world and I have a best friend there already. Oh, come to my city. We're going to go do, I'm going to do this. We're going to take it here. We're going to do this. You can stay in my house. Like it's instant 
instant friendship. You know what I mean? Lifelong instant friendship. Yeah. So like people and some some of my non jujitsu friends are crazy. I'm like, oh my God, like you have people from all over the world. I'm like, yeah, I mean, like sometimes we we meet once and you know, they become your best friends. You know, it's because of the universal language that we speak. This this jujitsu is like is, is a language that we speak, you know? It's so powerful. What's your experience of uh, jujitsu in the last couple of years? Danny's relatively new to it in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Well, well just just for me, coming from football or soccer, again, I've said it before, but I think you just find out who people really are on the mat. So you, there's no there's no faking it. Yeah. There's no in between. There's no snidiness because if they if if someone's talking shit off the mats, as soon as you get them on the mats, you find <laughs> out what they're really about. And I think that's the biggest change for me in yeah. in football and soccer. People talk a lot of shit because they can hide as a team game. Sure. They can go missing, you know, and they can uh, I don't know benefit from other people's discipline. Whereas yeah. in jujitsu, if you're not going to put in the work and if you're not going to listen and you're not going to get on the mats and you you know you're not going to have a good attitude you're not going to benefit. You're not going to get all those big gains. And that's what I like about it is that whatever you put in is what you get out. You know, there's, there's no one who does jujitsu that puts in loads of time, loads of effort, works on their physical and mental well-being, and then does a benefit of that. And again, that's what parallels life. You know what I mean? Like you put in the work in life, you put in the work with your family, you put in the work, you know, your business or your work, you're going to benefit from it. It really teaches us to be that discipline to, to do the things that we, we, we know we should. It's so hard to explain that to people that don't do jujitsu though. Yeah. And I feel like I say to all my friends that don't do jujitsu, I'm like, you need to try it. Like it changes your life. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, it, it really does. You need to get your ass like on the mats. Like, especially people that are like, uh, are lost or they're struggling with their mental health or they're, especially as men, as we get older, if we, if I didn't have jujitsu now, I don't even know what I'd be doing. I'd be so bored. I think I'd be just in the gym doing bits and pieces, but like for a hobby as an adult and learning new things, there's not a lot out there. There's not a lot like, and it's so fun, like choking pull out, you know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're right. Because at a certain point we stop using our brains. Okay. You can work out. You know, work out to the gym. I go to the gym. Hmm. But when do you really start to, you know, continue to use your uh, uh, thoughts in your brain? The real at adulthood, we really stop. Like as men, like we stop. Yeah. Our, our learning stops. What do we learn? I mean, unless you're picking up a new language, unless you're doing something, you know, extra. Most of us just stop. Yeah. And like 100%. for me, like without the mats, I I I really wouldn't know what to do. Like I'm even on my days off, you know, I mean, I, I teach and I train and then I have a couple of days off. Like even on my days off, I'm like, I usually go to the mats and hang out. Like I, it's, it's a place. I mean, it's almost like, I guess, going to a local pub, you know what I mean? Like I just, it's because you know, people are always there. Yeah. I know all my people are always there and whether I'm training or not, we, we, you know, we talk, we bullshit and, you know, we let's share some techniques here. And, and then maybe afterwards we're like this, you know, like on the weekends, we're always like after training, we're like, Hey, let's go to lunch. Like this past weekend, it was probably like 10, 12 of us went to a local, you know, market there, had food, had some beers, you know, good time building. And, but again, we're, we're building that, the strength in our community, even when we're doing that, right? And knowing that, hey, this person had our back, this person. And the next thing you know, we're like, hey, we're going to go do this competition. Who's in? Everybody's like, oh, man, I'm going to help you get ready. Like everybody pitches in, you know? And yeah. that's, that's the beauty of it. A, a good example was yesterday. Someone asked me to cover... Uh, a class next Friday and um, it's my birthday. So, and, and then I was like, oh, it's my birthday next Friday, but yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And she, and she was like, no, 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 you haven't got to do it. And I was like, look, it might be my birthday, but I, I enjoy jujitsu. Like what am I going to do? Go out for a meal? Yeah. I was like, I'm happy. I, I enjoy the Friday night class anyway. Like I'll come in and just do an open mat. Sure. And then I was like, I was like, Sonia, if I was a millionaire, I said, I'd still be coming in training. I was like, it makes no difference to me. It's what I enjoy. So to me, it's not a, it's not a chore to come in and cover a class and just do an open mat. It's to, it's what I would do if I if I had all the money in the world. I'd still probably be there on a Friday night doing that. Yeah. I might be in a better house and a better car driving driving to the gym, but effectively I'll be doing the same things. Oh, yeah, that's the beauty. That really is the beauty. It is, and, and you said obviously it's hard to explain to people, you know, the, the, yeah. the impact. But I guess that's where your your short stories and your anecdotes, Kenny, is is really powerful. And, and just thinking about those stories that you've heard, mate, I mean, what are, the, what are the ones that really stood out to you that really captured your soul and your heart when you heard them? You know, there's um, there's a lot of stories. But here's the thing. Like, I, I, there's several that really, 
uh, captured that we captured that really, you know, got to my heart. But now thinking back, the ones that didn't capture my interest may have caught someone else's interest. So I see all the stories as the same because I'm one man and what I think, oh, that story was captivating. That story was amazing. But you could have someone here, one person, if it, if it inspires one person, that story, that, that was a success. And that's what I'm looking for. So when people ask me that, I'm like, all of them now, all of them. Because some of them, you know, you feel like, ah, oh, that's not much. But this guy, like some of the people that don't want to open up and they, they just end up opening up, like even that alone in itself was something. Because that person, yeah. they were like, oh, my God, I can't believe he did that uh, uh, story because that person would never have opened up their mouths because they're just not that kind of person. But just being able to find the confidence to even do that and share their own story. So for me, every single story, because there's, I mean, if you, because if you go to our website, it's actually kind of crazy because now we have it uh, categorized. Uh, uh, mental mental awareness, and you'll have all the, the stories. You'll have uh, weight loss, all the stories, self-defense, all the stories. So there's different uh, stories that people share. And again, but then I, I, for me, I think they're all inspiring because I cannot pick pinpoint one or two that stands out because it may have been special to uh, many people, but every story is special to somebody, right? Yeah, it's just how it relates or resonates with them, isn't it? It's just, yeah. you, you see yourself in that position or that could happen to you or it has, has happened to them. And I think that's where it hits them, isn't it? But I think, I mean, if I had to pinpoint one, there's two guys, but one of them more specifically, it was Carlos. He's the blind warrior. If you guys look him up on Instagram, he's the blind warrior. He's down in Florida. He was, um, he's from a Latin American country, blind ever since he was a kid, small. And when he told his story, I, I mean, I literally would have tears in my eyes because it, it kind of resonated with me a little bit because he was talking about how he was bullied, not only for being blind, but small, but also, uh, you know, racist comments towards him, mm -hmm. you know, and like getting beat up and this and that. And then now he's a black belt, literally, at a, at a pretty high level competing, and he's getting all the respect. He's teaching, and he's basically living his dream. So that was a big self-preservance-like uh, 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 story that I thought was like, wow, this guy, if this blind guy can do this, people are yeah. like, it was so hard. I'm like, this small blind guy, he's probably 150 pounds if that, did it blind and he's still doing it at this level. Come on. What what are your excuses? You know? So if I had to pick one, I, I, I would say Carlos. Yeah. No, that's an amazing story and what an achievement for him. And I'm, I'm a big fan of longer form content. So I really enjoyed the docuseries in those episodes. Um, I've binge watched them this last week, actually just ahead of the, at, at meeting you. So... Yeah, I think they're great. And I mean, first of all, like um, amazingly well done because you can see where that money went because they look great and that they're really well produced. The, the money made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because you obviously had, uh, you mentioned Din Thomas with you and uh, I think even on the show you mentioned um, Dana White's looking for a fight series. And the production was up there with that, mate. It was really good. You know what? The, I actually asked Dean and I was like, they don't realize looking for a fight. You know what the crazy thing is? The production value in that is almost zero. Dean said it yeah, actually. He said it has one camera guy following him. That's it. And we have we have like two sound guys with boom mics, and we're mic'd up, and we've got three different camera angles, and we've got a you know producer. We got I mean like, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, no man, we have one guy that follows me around. Wow. I was like, that's, wow. the, that's the experience though there though, huh? You, the, the, the cost is in the, the quality yeah, of the person. Yeah, editing right too though. Like it's storytelling and editing. How do you tell the story? And then how do you edit that out? I mean, that's where, it, it, you know, you could be the best actor, but if they can't relay that message then they're not going to be able to do it. So, you know, it, it, it was well worth it for us. Yeah, and no, it was great. And obviously, you, you you had the opportunity to sit down with the uh, the Gracies, and then also spend some time with Tom DeBlas as well. Yeah. I mean, what was that experience with the Gracies like? First of all, sitting down with those guys. Uh, well, you know, here's the thing with those guys. I've had many experiences with them. I'm, I'm I have a personal relationships with them. So, outside of the 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 the, uh, the show, 
you know, we've trained together, camps together, we party together. So I, I've got a good relationship with them. But, you know, it's, it's, they, they bring this aura of energy to the room, you know, especially at that side of the family, meaning, you know, there's a lot of Gracie's, right? But I call them the Henzo side, you know, the Henzo's line. So Henzo, all his, all his black belt, his cousins like Audrey, you know, Holis, Eagle, all those guys. They bring this. They're they're not only great at what they do. They're great leaders. They're 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 caring. They're fun. Uh, they're they're exceptional human beings to me. They're 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 um, they really live up to the name. Like it's it's someone that you can really look up to. And these guys are just uh, like you know heroes of yours, right? And for a lot of people, like they come to the camps and watch them and 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 and, and train with them, it's a, it's quite an experience because again, like another one of the guys that was training there was like, when are you surrounded by like five you know Gracies that are high highest level of Gracies to get to train with them? Not only train with them, but like hang out with them for you know, a, a week or so. So if you guys haven't done it, go check out Gracie Adventure Camp. All this uh, host that you know like uh, Hodger's always there. Igor, Gregor, Kira Gracie's there sometimes. Enzo comes by sometimes. Big high-level guys are always there. These camps are always fun. So if you guys are listening or watching this, go check out Gracie Adventure Camp. Hollis, I'm plugging you in. Um, it's, it's always a great time. Yeah, awesome. And and obviously, uh, you had the episode with, with Tom as well. And and he's somebody that Dan and I follow on social media. And we'd love to have a conversation with him at some point. But obviously, he's got a remarkable kind of mindset and, and attitude towards life and, and jujitsu. And he, uh, yeah, he, obviously, the, the what he was talking about in regard to his kind of transition from where he was to now, I thought was great. And I think you captured that really well. How was your time with Tom? Man. You know, Tom is a, he's a man. That's, that's all I can say. He's a man. Like, he's a man. man. Like, he'll, he'll tell you straight up how he feels, right? Like, it's, there's no, the way you see him on social media is the way he is. There's no hiding behind <laughs> a wall, hiding behind, you know, a keyboard. Tom will tell you, like, well, I believe in Jesus, but you fuck with me. I'm going to fuck you up. Like, that's the type of person that Tom is, right? Like, he's real. That's all I can say. Like, I enjoyed my time. We spent the entire weekend up there. We were at his house. We were swimming, eating pizza together. It was his, met his lovely mother. And, uh, you know, obviously, he, he allowed me to teach a seminar at his school, which was an honor for me. I got to meet his students. I mean, just everybody there was just, um, just I mean, it, they were all real. Like, like Tom puts... Like whatever you see Tom put on his social media, that's Tom in real life. Yeah. Like, there was no, again, no hiding. There was no like, uh, you know, acting. It was just the way. I think, I think that's the secret to his success though, because yeah. he doesn't care. He's just like, this is me. This is what I believe in. This is what I want to do. Like it or don't like it. Yeah, because, you know, some guys are saying, oh man, Tom stick to posting jujitsu or this and that. Stop talking about Jesus. He was like, you know, I praise my Jesus, I love my Jesus, but fuck you, I'll fuck you up. You start talking shit to me, like you know, you know that's that's just that's that's all, you know, and, and and you gotta love him for that. Like he's he's, yeah. he's real, and and I'm, I'm I'm so happy for him for all the success. He just became, I think, the vice president of the the grappling through one championship. Um, you know, his he's got one of the biggest organizations. His school's doing awesome. He's he's doing all these camps and he, his uh, uh, buddies over bullies program is doing good where he's helping all these kids that are getting bullied. You know, that's the thing. Once, once a person hits a, a pinnacle of, um, you know, his uh, career, people, there's always going to be haters. You know, they're always talking about this and I'm not just talking about Tom, but other people too. But, you know, I think Tom does a good job of like countering that. It's like, Hey man, good luck to you. I love you. Jesus loves you. Hey man, do your thing, but I'm going to do me like, uh, so yeah, he's, he's, he's nothing but incredible like, as, as a human being. Some of my favorite bits though is where he, he screenshots the messages and he's just like, yeah, this is where I am. Come and fight me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, here's my <laughs> he's like, turn up, just come and fight me. You want to fight? No, just come and fight me. Hard. And you believe him, don't you? You believe oh, if they turn up, people like, yeah, yeah, no, fight He shows up because they know he's real. He was telling me a story <laughs> when we were sitting down uh, for the interview at his house. He said something about his neighbor came by and said something. He said, he just walked over to his neighbor and said, okay, well, you're going to meet me here in my front yard and you're going to fight me because I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> 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 if I remember correctly, he said like the neighbor basically moved out of the neighborhood after that. <laughs> <laughs> Some funny story. 
<laughs> and it, it, and you got to believe him too. It's like the realest story he told. Like he didn't miss a beat. It, it, it was a great story. Like that's that's the way he was. So I enjoyed my time with him. But like every story that I've I've gotten, every episode that I've done, every even short story that I've gotten, it, it's it's really it, it it does a number on me. Like it, it makes me realize like. Sometimes it makes me realize like what I have, you know, how thankful I am because some people are going through these struggles, right? And to know that like I don't have to go through that or I am not going through that. I'm very appreciative of that. And like so that's why I try to be there for people as much as I can to help. Like it's it's um I think I'm in a good position where I'm at a a point in my life where it's not just about me, 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 but it's about how can I give back how can i uh help people you know I, I, same thing with tom i mean tom's thumbs again he's at the top of his uh, uh uh realm right now and uh he's just giving back he's doing whatever he can to give back and all these opportunities are um opening up for him because of that i think you know it's, it's i think when you're just selfish it, it really doesn't you know pan out that way but whereas when when you're truly about helping and and, and uh spreading this kind of love and uh, whatnot, it, the opportunities like open up. So uh, that's kind of where I am, and, and and I can't wait to see what the future holds. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm not looking for uh, monetization. I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I want to do whatever I can in my means to uh, get this to mainstream. Like jujitsu is mainstream, but it's not mainstream. You know what I'm saying? Like it's mainstream in a way that we as practitioners, we as jujitsu guys. No, like we're connected. Oh yeah, well, I know about this, you know, tournament. I know about this camp. I know about this that instructor, this black belt. It's all over the world. There's it's so big, but we're in a little bubble. We're in a little subcategory, right? So outside of this, people are like, what? Some people don't know that it's like you know, when you're talking about Japanese jujitsu, or you're talking. So people don't have any idea of what this is. So uh, you know, my job right now is to break that barrier, and I want. You know, we're still in talks, but, you know, it's so Hollywood is so hard right now. We're still in talks, but, you know, we actually had a, almost a deal where I had a big name uh, actor that was going to be my uh, co-host. And it was almost supposed to done. But again, somehow it didn't work out. And so we're still searching for uh, people to work with, great directors and producers, and, and, and hopefully get it to a network. So if any network's watching, please <laughs> consider this. And so hopefully we're, we're, I want to get it to a, a bigger audience, right? So not only the jiu-jitsu audience, not only the friends, but like the general public. I want everybody to be able to turn on their TV or their apps. And then, you know, Matt May shows up because I want jiu-jitsu to be a household name, but not only in, I don't want people to say, okay, I, I, I have to do jiu-jitsu. I want people to see jiu-jitsu as a, um, as a, again, a parallel to life and find their jujitsu. Their jujitsu could be something else. It could be weightlifting. It could be bowling. It could be running. It could be anything, right? Anything that could positively change the outlook of your life, right? And I think that's what jujitsu is. That's what Matt made is. It's not jujitsu. Like you have to, you don't have to train jujitsu. Find your jujitsu, whatever that is, right? I want to. I want to do the best so I can connect people to jujitsu. But if this is not your thing, you may not be able to physically do it. You may be uh, mentally not be able to do it. You may not have the financial means or the time to do it. But you can find your jujitsu. And again, I, I can't tell you what that is. But hopefully, once we get it to mainstream, people will realize that look, I can find my own jujitsu, and that could be anything, right, to better their lives. Yeah, yeah, I love that, mate. And is that where you're currently at with season two? Then is it you're still in the process of trying to find the sort of partners to work with? Yeah, right now we're. I've got a. I got a couple of fishing lines out. You know, I've still got uh, the producer that I'm working with. Uh, his um, non-scripted company has. Uh, we've gotten our deck out to some. Um, what we want to do is we, it's, we, we're trying to bring in a um, a non-script, so basically non-scripted producer to come on board with us to say, hey, I want to work with you guys. And then once we have that, what we'll do is we'll actually have the debt go out to a few different um, streaming companies, whether it's Netflix, Prime, whatever it may be. And then hopefully they'll be able to see something and then um, we want to you know, 
uh, partner up with us and start filming, right? So, but it's it's simple as that, but it's not that simple. Like I, I learned the hard <laughs> way. It's it's I don't know that world, you know. And uh, so, and I'm, I'm I'm talking to a few different actors that are behind me, and they they want you know they want to help as much as they can. So hopefully, with some of their connections, uh, you know, well, you know, I was kind of devastated that it didn't work out the way I wanted it and the way we had it planned. But again, that's life and that's jujitsu, you know. Like not everything, like you know. You're not going to always catch that arm bar. You're not going to always catch that triangle. You know, you're yeah. going to you have to start all over to build yourself back up. So that's kind of where we are. I'm, I'm, I'm still very enthused and excited about what potentially what this could bring. So it's uh, it's still full steam forward. You know, I, 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 uh, the, 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 the reasoning behind it is uh, greater than just a TV show. So I think uh, once, you know, people realize that obviously Hollywood, you know, they they need to see immediate return. They need to know, be like, hey, hey, how are we gonna bring people back for season two? How are we gonna bring, you know, money into this? How are we gonna get viewers right? So they're gonna be able to. They're gonna try to uh, uh, manipulate it a little bit. We've already changed the, the 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 theme of the show a little bit. Like it's like a right now we have it where it's almost like a challenge where we're gonna bring people in and they're gonna change, but we're gonna give them a challenge. So a little more, you know. And I'm still sticking to the core value of what Matt Made is about, but making it a little more TV friendly. So that's kind of where we are, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, good luck with that, my friend. You should reach out to uh, not 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 suggesting this is easy to do, but you should reach out to Tom Hardy, mate. I think he'd be um, an we, amazing conversation. We'd love to have uh, Tom Hardy as someone. I, I know he's very much you know deep into jujitsu. And that will be somebody that we would love to work with. And because, and, 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 you know, if they love it, they're going to want to want to be a piece of it. So, well, you guys, are, you guys are the Englishmen. So maybe you yeah. guys want that with him. <laughs> yeah, well, he does a lot of work with a, uh, Real, a yeah, with a charity in the UK called Reorg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He follows me on, on 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 Instagram. Yeah, New York. Yeah, I know he works with them. he works with Tom sometimes. I know, but he's you know he's a you know he's a he's an A lister. It's it's very hard to <laughs> yeah. you know try to get in uh, uh, in touch with somebody like that because you know I'm sure they get advances all the time. Oh, you should do this. You should do that. You should come on this show. You know, like and so we're probably at the bottom right now but hopefully i know he actually has uh liked one of our matt made stories a lot of celebrities actually have uh, mm. come through the channel and liked it so i know it's the exposure is there and hopefully one day you know they they, they feel it where they see a, maybe a podcast like this or here and then they're like you know what maybe i'll reach out and then uh you know make it make this thing blow up because if they have the love as uh, much love as they do as like i do then you know they're going to want to be part of this yeah 100 percent. i think someone like tom as well i think he struggled with addiction and everything himself in in, in his sort of previous life so yeah you never know mate we'll uh we'll obviously do what we can in regard to plugging it but you yeah. never know and uh, kenny just uh, if you've got time what one story that i'd love to hear about is is your own mate um you obviously said that this was kind of born out of your own experience yeah. and you know, alluded to what jujitsu and martial arts has given you. So if you've got time, I'd love to hear about, I guess, how you grew up and, and how you found martial arts and jujitsu and, and what that gave you. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I grew up here in Atlanta, it was suburbs of Atlanta. And, uh, you know, this is back in the eighties. This is when I was a kid. Uh, I got to tell you, I mean, it was a struggle at the time because I was the, I was the only non Caucasian at my elementary school. Right, okay. I was the only non, so, I mean, it was like, teachers would just look at me like, what are you? They went there. I mean, they, they didn't even know how to ask uh, my ethnicity. This is how ignorant people were back then. And so, and I actually wrote, my, my book is called Matt Made. I actually wrote a book talking about this and then the show came later. But And so, <clears throat> growing up, for me, I didn't know any difference. I just thought I was me. And then by the time I was in middle school, that's when I started to kind of realize, wow, maybe we are a little different. Uh, and, and, and again, these comments, racist comments came from ignorance, right? Because they've never been around it. So, you know, I, I heard it all, you know, name calling to, you know, you know uh, funny face making to, you know, do you know karate to, which was kind of, <laughs> which was kind of cool because every time they say that I'm like, yeah, I can kick your ass. And I've been in a lot of fights where 
uh, um, they say that. But uh, so that's that's how I grew up. So I was always on on guard. I was always ready to fight. I was always ready to physically, verbally defend myself because I was always on the receiving end. And then I was a smaller guy too. Uh, and so throughout middle school, and then so I'm training. I'm training Taekwondo at the time ever since I was like three, four years old. And I'm very confident. Like that, that's, I think, where I was. Like I'm, I was confident, but I was angry. I was always ready to blow. I was, I was ready. Like you even look at me, I'm gonna pounce at you. Like, what the hell are you looking at? Like, because I was always like all my life, I was just on guard. And I think I was like that to even in my thirties. You know, like it's now that I, I feel like I'm a whole man. Like I've. I've I've found peace and I know where, where I stay. And so that's where I was. And then in high school, getting into high school, for the first time I, I met my people, meaning ethnicity-wise, I met some Korean kids randomly like working. And I thought, oh my God, I didn't even know they existed. And that's how rare it was. And I was like, oh my God. And I met them and then I started hanging out with them and it was a completely different world. And these guys were already partying. I, I wasn't partying I mean, in high school, like 15, 16. These guys were smoking, drinking, drugs. I mean, girls were around, but it was like, oh my God, I want to do this too. And they understood me and I understood them because we ate the same food. We had the same tradition. We had the same mom and dad story where, you know, we were Latsky kids where our parents were immigrants. So they basically went to work almost 16, 18 hour days. Like they're gone. And so uh, they just leave the kids at home. So we do whatever the hell we wanted to do because we didn't have parents driving us to play football. You know, no, you stayed home. And so we had the same story, right? So I started hanging out with this crowd. And of course, a few years in, you know, I go to jail with them, um, you know, a bunch of, bunch of, you know, soft stories, whatever. And then the, finally, a few of my friends ended up uh, robbing a gas station. And at the time, I had a gun. They were like, let me borrow your gun. And I was like, no. <clears throat> well, they said, we're going to do it anyways with it, with it or without it. Long story short, I let them borrow my gun. I had a job on a Saturday, so I go to work and they rob a gas station. And then I get a phone call. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know, of course, been locked up multiple times, but they're still there laughing. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we robbed a gas station. We got, we got, we got caught, whatever, we're in jail. I was like, all right, well, as soon as you, and I, we're 17 at the time. And I'm like, well, as soon as you find out what the bail is, let us know. And we get our friends together and we'll see if we can get some money together. And uh, a day goes by, a week goes by, a month goes by. And finally, they're like, we had a court date. They're like, there's no bail. We're being charged with uh, um, uh, attempted armed robbery and then aggravated assault. And at the time, I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, you know, I'm young. And I was like, what does that mean? They're like, well, they say we're going to do 10 years. What? <laughs> 17 years old. 10 years. So we're like, oh man, you know, and and one of the kids, his uh, parents were financially well off. So we're gonna get a good lawyer and get you out, whatever. So anyway, so out of the five of them, uh, I think uh, four of them did, they did 10 to five. So they did five years at 17. And then the one who had the gun, which at the time was my best friend, I think he did seven or eight years. So by then, I was already like training jujitsu. I was already doing me. Like that kind of deterred me away from that crowd, right? I was like, wow, I can't, I can't, I gotta. So I, went, I quit high school, but I went back to high school, graduated, and I'm teaching, I'm working, I'm, I'm doing whatever I can. And these guys get out. And when they got out, of course, I wanted to hang out with them again. So we did for a couple of years, but the vibe just wasn't there because now their minds were just pre wired for prison. It was, they became bigger criminals. And as soon as they got out, they're already doing harder drugs, talking about doing some other stuff. Long story short, so out of the five of them, I think three of them are dead now. I think two of them got killed. One of them committed suicide. The other one's on the run. And then one, I don't know. It's, it's one of those stories, right? It's almost like a movie. 
So that basically let me know that, hey, I, I, I need to change my life. I need to do something. And so that's basically around the same time I found Jiu Jitsu, I was training. And I, I started to find myself. I started getting angry when I got tapped. And I'm like, ah, if, I, if this was a real fight, I could beat this guy up. You know, in my mind, I'm saying this. And of course, Darcy, the 45 year old woman, is arm barring me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, one day at a time, I'm finding myself, I'm building patience. I didn't have any patience. I was always, you know, on the go. I didn't have, uh, I always had anger issues. I've had, I mean, you name it, that was me. And so by the time I got to Black Belt, this is 14 years ago, uh, I started all over again. I was like, man, I'm learning things. Like, I, I truly believe this is the, the, the beginning of my journey of not only jujitsu, but my life. Like, I felt like now, I'm realizing who I am, the person that I am, and the lessons that I'm learning from this. And so fast forward, right at Black Belt, that's when I realized all the changes that I've seen so far. And then I took, took those values and then kept on running forward. So fast forward to who, who we are, who I am now, Jiu-Jitsu was 20, 25 years in the timeline. And then my hard life was probably the first 10 like this. Right. And so jujitsu was always a big part of where I was and I never left. And I always went back. It was like church for me. Whenever I had something going on, I was always back on the mats. Right. I was always back on the mats. Maybe I feel defeated. I was always back on the mats. And so I wanted to take that, not only my story, but, uh, the the effect that it had on me, and I wanted to show people that first, you could you could beat anything. Number two, for the young guys that are coming up that don't have anything in their life, we, I grew up in a poor family. I mean, again, obviously, again from immigrant family, I didn't have a pair of Nike shoes until I was able to afford it whenever I was you know nineteen, twenty years old. Right? I wanted to let the second generation looking up and be like. If that guy can do it, that heavy, heavily tattooed guy who had problems, this and that, went to jail, went with the wrong crowd, can do it. I can do it. And again, that goes back to jujitsu being whatever their jujitsu is, right? Like if that, can, that guy can be successful in life, I can do it too. So I wanted to be more of an inspiration, and which is kind of funny even now. Some people, uh, I get DMs where they're like, thanks for being who you are. I mean, like some, something simple as that. I do it. And I'm like, well, the message is getting out. There. And that's all I wanted to do. And that's how Matt Made was started. Because it was my story. I'm like, I'm Matt Made. Right? I'm Matt Made. And so, and that's how it got started. I'm like, okay, aside from me, how can I inspire other people to be their own Matt Made? And again, not only jujitsu, whatever their Matt is. Right? From, for me, Matt was where I was, the, the Matt was where I was made. You can be whatever made, you know, self-made, you know, ball made, whatever you're made of, right? But jujitsu and Matt are something that correlates to life and whatever they can make it to. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's some story, mate. And, you know, nothing to that extent, but, you know, certainly I've been in and out of jujitsu for, for many years, as I say, and, you know, grew up in a deprived area in the UK. And there's definitely been periods, you know, in my early adult life where I was a little bit lost and, didn't have a whole lot of purpose in jujitsu as inconsistent as my attendance was at times was always a consistent thing in my life. Um, and it always gave me some level of structure. And I've talked previously, you know, in my professional life, in my personal life, how some of the values, um, that I've learned on the mats and in mm -hmm. jujitsu have allowed me to, to kind of live a, a, a more productive and, and better life. I think, um, even just down to professionally, just, you know, being able to collaborate with people well, um, being able to, you know, admit when I'm wrong, to be able to make mistakes and all these things. And I think, you know, growing up, uh, I definitely had a bit of a chip on my shoulder as well. Um, felt like I had something to prove. And over time, I've just been humbled and, you know, sure. have, have, uh, have that kind of piece that you talked about as well a little bit, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's sometimes it's hard to explain the the benefits of what you know the jiu-jitsu can do for uh, an individual 
And again, that's why we why I want to try to make as many pieces as I can so people see it over and over and over until they're ready to step on the mats. You know? And then we, we want to give them that tool where we want to make it easy as possible for them to do it. So they can just click a link and then just go there and they're ready to find their home and, and, and start changing their lives, you know? Yeah, mate, it's, it's great. It's amazing work you're doing. If people want to check out the, the content and get involved with any projects that you're working on at the moment, where can they find you and, and where can they do that? Yeah, so my personal uh, Instagram and TikTok and uh, all my channels on uh, YouTube is at Kenny Kim BJJ. And then for Matt Made, they can just go to Matt Made on YouTube. On Instagram, I think it's Matt Made underscore show. And by they can, they'll, they'll be able to uh, uh, link, link it from my personal page. They can go there as... Uh, if you guys want to collaborate, do anything, just please uh, send me a message and then I'll try to get back to you guys as soon as I can. And uh, hopefully I can get visit you guys one day here in, in the UK. Yeah, that'd be cool. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Welcome anytime, my friend. And uh, thank you so much for coming on chatting to us today. It's been great to meet you. And uh, again, I, I love the work you do, mate. So please keep doing it. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for having me on. I had a great time this morning. And like I said, uh, uh, let's you guys keep doing you know again the same thing send positivity and put messages out there and let's make this better a uh, better world definitely mate thank you thanks buddy speak to you soon yeah.